The theme of this year's lecture is National Security Management, Some Concerns. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sri N. N. Vora for the keynote address. I'm very happy to be associated with today's program. The NIA celebrating is raising day. It's a premier apex counterterrorism agency in our country. And for the past seven years, it had been growing in strength and taking on larger responsibilities. I'm also particularly happy to be associated with today's function because Mr. Raju belonged to the JNK Kader. I had the opportunity of knowing him as a middle level officer, middle seniority level officer. And subsequently, when he had reached apex of his career, he had returned for a short while to the Kader. At that time, there was governor's rule. There was a demand from Delhi to get him back. So he came back here. He was the founder director of this very eminent organization. And he made it proud. He made himself proud. I would also take the opportunity of conveying my sentiments and salutations to Mrs. Raju and other members of the family on this important occasion. I thought that it could not be a better occasion except to speak, even though briefly, about certain matters, concerns relating to national security management, which in my opinion, uh, we have been grappling with and haven't got the better of. Now, because of the constraint of time, I will not be able to speak in, in any comprehensive manner, but I will touch upon some of the threats which loom large around us, not merely Pathan Court, but beyond that, and what is it that we are doing to prepare ourselves better for the times to come. I also take this opportunity of uh, joining everybody else in the audience to convey my compliments and congratulations to all the officers of NIA who have been awarded by the Honorable Home Minister. In any discussion on national security management, it needs to be remembered that India is a large country of subcontinental dimensions with land and sea borders of nearly 23,000 kilometers, about 1,200 islands, an exclusive economic zone of several million square kilometers. The country's growing population of over a billion and a quarter comprises more than 4,600 communities which subscribe to every religion practice in the world, speak 179 languages, and nearly 550 dialects, and whose socio-cultural traditions are rooted deep in thousands of years of his history. <coughs> in the totally free environment of our vast democracy, the unhindered interplay of communal and other forces have the potential, and actually do so, of generating confrontations and conflicts which disturb the security environment. Our security interests are also adversely affected by geopolitical developments in our neighborhood and even far beyond. And since the advent of terrorism, the safeguarding of national security has emerged as the most vital challenge to the preservation of the country's unity and integrity. In this context, it would be useful to rapidly examine the adequacy of the existing apparatus for meeting the arising threats to national security. The Constitution of India demarcates the responsibilities of the Union and the states. 
Accordingly, the union, which for ease of reference this morning, I will refer to as the center, is responsible for the defense of India and protecting the states against war or external aggression, while the states are responsible for establishing trained police organizations for maintaining public order within their jurisdictions. It is also the duty of the center to protect the states against internal disturbances. Thus, broadly speaking, while the states are responsible for the maintenance of internal security, the center is responsible for safeguarding external security, and besides, this is important, protecting the states against disturbances which go far beyond the mere maintenance of law and order. If we take a quick look at the maintenance of security in the past nearly seven decades, it would be observed that in the early years after independence, the police could perhaps maintain public order by its very presence, or merely warning a, a gathering crowd to disperse peacefully or face a Lati charge. However, in the past years, there has been enormous change in the scale and gravity of the problems of law and order and security threats which have been faced in the country. Amongst the many rising challenges, the police have had to combat militancies, insurgencies, left-wing extremism, and Pakistan proxy war in JNK for the last over two and a half decades. And after the advent of terrorism in our country, the threats to national security have assumed frightening dimensions. In most states, the police organizations, the first responders in the security management apparatus, do not have the requisite strength, I underline that, and the resources for dealing with serious disturbances on their own, much less combat terror attacks. In this context, it would be relevant to observe that as on 1st January 2014, the sanctioned countrywide strength of state, civil, and armed police forces was over 22.83 lakhs, against which, very significantly, as many as 5.61 lakh posts, which is about 25% of the total, remained unfilled. 25% of the total sanctioned strength of the police all over the country was not available. And in 2013-14, the figures, latest figures available to me, the all India expenditure on police was rupees 64,264 crore, which accounts for a meager 2.95% of the total budgeted expenditure of all the states and union territories taken together. Regrettably, of this amount, of this expenditure which I mentioned, no more than 1.7% of the total expenditure on police all over the country was spent on the training of the personnel. And it is significant, over 80% of the annual police budgets in the states go towards the payment of salaries and pensions, and very little is left, and on occasions nothing at all, for the progressive modernization and for enlarging the strength of the forces. Even these few limited statistics, which I have just mentioned, clearly show that the required attention has not been given for ensuring the satisfactory maintenance of the state police organizations. The center has been aware of these inadequacies, which have been repeatedly exposed while combating Naxal violence, the insurgencies in the Northeast region, prolonged militancy in Punjab, Pakistan proxy war, and more recently in meeting the onslaught of terrorism. Accepting that the states are unable to deal on their own with the rising security problems, the Union Home Ministry has been assisting them by deploying the Central Armed Police Forces for supporting the police, state police 
and restoring normalcy in the disturbed areas. And in situations which cannot be handled by the state police and the CAPF operating together, the center has also been deploying the Indian Army. As regards the factors which have thwarted the state police organization from developing the required capabilities for effectively maintaining internal security on their own, it could be briefly said that their inadequacies arise from the continuing failures of the states to provide sustained budgetary support for the maintenance, upgradation, and progressive enlargement in the strength of the constabularies. Another reason for the decline is the constant political interference, which has caused untold damage to the discipline, morale, professionalism, and worst of all, there has been no serious interest in remedying the systemic degradation which is continuing until today, barring very few exceptions, almost all the states have brazenly refused to implement to carry out police reform. Even after the onset of terrorism and a quantum jump in the nature and scale of threats to national security, the states have not only failed to set their houses in order, but also defaulted, and I think this is a double offense, in not supporting the center's initiatives to establish the various required legal, institutional, logistical, and other arrangements for setting up a strong base for counterterrorism. Constitutionally, the center may issue formal directives to the affected states to take preemptive actions or enforce given measures for the maintenance of internal security within their territories. However, considering the pattern and nature of the center-state relations, which have evolved over the past years, such approaches have not so far been found feasible. Thus, on account of considerations arising from coalition politics and other hesitations, the Union Home Ministry has been generally following the practice of issuing advisories, distinguished from directives. Advisories to the states about merging security situations, keeping the whole country informed of what is happening where. This is a mechanism for, for uh, cautioning the various states what, what may happen, likely to happen. It is a matter for concern that in the past years, some of the states have not timely heeded even these advisories and have also been found wanting in not reporting emerging disturbances to the Union Home Ministry. Despite their poor track records, many states have taken the position that the center must do nothing which interferes with their constitutional right to maintain law and order. Now, this is not a rational posture. The states cannot continue with taking such positions. Also, they must realize that the jihadi networks and the terror organizations which have been steadily extending their reach and enlarging their resources, do not recognize territorial boundaries and can strike with lightning speed at any target of their choosing. Consequent to the Kar Kargil War and after 26-11, the gruesome terror attack in Bombay, the center had come up with several ideas regarding what needs to be done to establish a second, a sound, counter-terrorism machinery. Certain proposals had been announced, which included expansion of the intelligence apparatus and the crime and criminal network systems, associated databases, coastal policing and security, establishing NAT grid, NIA, NCTC, NTRO, several other arrangements. The National Investigation Agency, set up under the National Investigation Agency Act of 2008, has been functioning for the past seven years and among its several responsibilities, this agency has been established with the prime objective of investigating and prosecuting offenses which affect the sovereignty, security, and integrity of India. As decisions continue to pend in regard to several major proposals, today NIA is India's prime counterterrorism agency. In this context, it is regrettable that even this agency has not received the required support on several fronts. For one, the states continue to oppose NIA taking over cases of serious offenses from the very dates of their occurrences. Now, in, 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 in any crime, in any major crime, 
any delay in lodging an FIR, any delay in investigation is very costly. And in cases of terror strikes, it is difficult to describe the loss that occurs if you do not take the most prompt immediate action from within minutes of the offence having taken place. Without ta and taking over cases of serious offences from the very dates of their occurrences, in many cases, NIA is able to take over important cases only after prolonged delays, and in some cases, even after the state police have filed charge sheets. A great deal of damage has already been done. A recent inexcusable example relates to the terror attack on police station Dinanagar in Punjab on 27 July 2015. If this case had been promptly taken over by NIA, the infiltration routes would have been identified and park terror groups may perhaps never have succeeded in attacking the Pathan Kot Air Base on 2nd January this year. In this context, I would strongly urge the Union Home Ministry to very strictly enforce the statutory requirement the Act lays down for every state to promptly report to the centre the commission of any scheduled offence. Side by side, the Union Home Ministry, in my opinion, should, whenever necessary, Suomoto direct the NIA to investigate a scheduled offence, and the NIA Act 2008 empowers the centre to do so. It is also important that the states ensure against any impediment whatsoever coming in the way of NIA's investigation. This particular case is finally not to be taken over by this agency. Sometimes NIA, for good reason, has to investigate into certain incidents, may finally not take it over and leave it to the state to investigate and prosecute. But that doesn't mean that the state police is not obligated to provide the fullest support to the NIA and see that there is no delay whatsoever in the investigation. The Union Home Ministry, in my opinion, should also take urgent steps to ensure that NIA's legal framework is suitably modified. From the JNK point of view, I have been closely following this matter, and I find that to enable effective investigation terror cases, the existing schedule to the NIA Act also requires to be reviewed for enlarging the list of offences to particularly cover and include those under the Ranveer Penal Code, Arms Act, NDPS Act, Explosive Substances Act, and Cyber Terrorism Offences, among many other offences. Attention also needs to be given to upgrade and enhance powers and techniques for special investigations. I think we are lacking in that and rationalizing the obtaining systems and procedures for the establishment of special courts and completion of trials within the envisaged time frame. If NIA is to early evolve as a truly powerful counterterrorism agency, it should be necessary to ensure that it is provided the strongest possible support by the law enforcement machinery all over the country, as well as by all the central and state intelligence agencies. Having pointed to the need for enabling NIA to develop its full potential, I would once again refer to my earlier comments on the deficiencies of the state police organizations and reiterate that no counterterrorism agency can deliver an effective response if the police, which is the baseline organization, first response organization, continues to suffer from various serious maladies. I would therefore reiterate once again the crucial importance of ensuring that the very long pending police reforms are implemented without any further delay. In the long list of matters relating to police reforms, the highest priority requires to be given to fully restoring the internal discipline and the command and control systems, selecting the best and most experienced officers of proven integrity and appointing them as Director Generals of Police for a short tenure, not for three months or two months. After appointing the best available officers to key positions from the district level upwards, the political executive must ensure against any interference with or influence being exerted on the functioning of the state police force. If India has to establish a strong and trustworthy counterterrorism apparatus, it shall be necessary to forthwith give up the continuing ad hoc approaches and devote the highest priority to establishing a well-considered nationwide institutional framework for security management.
In this context, it would need to be kept in mind that for a very long period now, particularly since Pakistan launched its proxy war in JNK, serious issues relating to internal and external security management have got closely intertwined. It is not just that such and such an incident or such and such a problem belongs to South Bloc, to Ministry of Defense, to the Army headquarters, and such and such a matter belongs to the state, and such and such a matter belongs to the Home Ministry. It is all, all very closely intertwined. It is therefore necessary that the center evolves a national security policy which takes a holistic view of all concerns about the effective security management on all India bases. This means including all the states and union territories. As it is not feasible this morning to comment extensively on the steps required to be taken to prepare the national security policy, I would briefly state that the policy frame for national security management shall need to be evolved after systematic consultations with the states and with all the central departments and agencies which are concerned with security management, particularly the Defense Ministry, the Intelligence Bureau, the External Intelligence Agency, and other departments and agencies of the Government of India, like the Foreign Office, who are also very closely concerned with security management. They contribute to it, they have the capacity to do certain things to, to push the overall objectives forward. The national security policy should, in my opinion, inter alia, clearly delineate the role and responsibilities of the security administration machinery at the center and in the states, and the operating procedures, I underline, I've seen what happened in Pathan Court recently, operating procedures which are required to be strictly followed in dealing with any challenge to the country's security without precious time having to be lost in seeking approvals, clearances of one or the other kind. To ensure the effective management of, the nas of national security, it shall also be necessary for time-bound steps being taken to see that especially trained and experienced persons are appointed to operate the security administration machinery. Thus, the existing practice both at the center and in the states, of security management tasks being assigned to functionaries drawn from different streams and cadres would have to end in a firm policy adopted to ensure that to begin with, the central security management system is manned by trained functionaries who are capable of satisfactorily carrying out the tasks assigned to them. In the foregoing context, over 15 years ago, I had proposed, I was asked to chair a task force on internal security in the times of NDA-1. In this task force report on internal security, the September 2000, I submitted the report. I had proposed that a dedicated pool of officers for manning the security administration apparatus should be formed by seeking volunteers from all civil, police, defense, DRDO, science and technology, management, banking, telecom, and various other areas of functioning and imparted specialized training in each of the required areas of expertise. In dealing with the, as NIA officers would be able to tell us better, during investigations, in various uh, small pieces of information become available. They required a trained person to respond to those bits and pieces, to follow them up, and to see what exactly they imply whether it's telecom, whether it's banking, it is a fake currency, it is drugs, all these are areas which require specialization and not a generalist approach. Officers from this pool could then be handpicked to perform identified roles in the central security system, management system, putting an end to the ongoing practice of inducting functionaries of varied backgrounds who have no past exposure or experience in the security arena. Keeping in view the serious security threats which have been faced by the country since the aforesaid recommendation was made, that is 15 years ago, or 16 now, and considering the obtaining grave challenges to national security, today I strongly recommend that the time has come to go the, travel the full distance and establish a National Security Administrative Service, which all India ramifications, officers of this trained carder would serve right from the tip of India to the north, from the east to the west. 
and these specially trained constituents of this cadre should man the apparatus run by the center and be also progressively assigned to manage the security management systems in the states. I would stress, therefore, the high importance of promulgating a national security policy and urgently establishing an institutional framework which is responsible, one, for the efficient implementation of all decisions regarding security management, two, undertaking constant monitoring of situations emerging on various fronts, which with the Intelligence Bureau does most of the time, as also raw, but uh, we, we need another agency which follows up on the warnings which we receive. And third, evolving dynamic approaches which harmonize the respective mandates of all the central ministries and agencies concerned with security management as also the issues raised by the states. And finally, I would say, yet once again, I'm repeating myself, that if the sovereignty, unity, and integrity of our country is to be preserved, it is of crucial, vital importance that strong and close center-state understandings are established in regard to each and every matter which relates to safeguarding national security. Thank you very much.